today. This is a this is a faculty panel uh, entitled uh, "Playing with Time, Space, Matter, Identity." Uh, as in the other panels, this is a very very uh, interdisciplinary panel representing four different fields: urban planning, philosophy, nanotechnology, digital humanities, and film studies. And as in the other faculty uh, panels that happened earlier, uh, you know, the uh, panelists uh, will not be talking about their own work as much as talking across uh, across fields, and which also means talking about. I really like this aspect of this, uh, this roundtable or panel that actually we're talking about somebody else's work. Um, and I'm really, you know, uh, uh, I'm really interested in finding out about all the panelists' work. My name is Shimei Shi. I'm a professor here in Comparative Literature, Asian Studies, and Asian American Studies. I'm happy to be uh, moderating this panel. And I'm going to be very vigilant because apparently uh, earlier panels, there wasn't enough time for discussion. And so in the spirit of talking about and speaking about and speaking across, uh, each uh, presenter will speak uh, a maximum of seven minutes and uh, at that point, they're just going to have to stop. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, with, since they're talking about each other's work, while they talk a bit about their work and somehow uh, make those connections, uh, they, you know, they will in some ways be commenting upon each other and having questions for each other, but we're going to hold those questions uh, uh, to be responded to while uh, we take questions from the audience first, and then the uh, panelists will integrate the comments that they get from each other into their responses uh, of the, uh, to, to the audience uh, together. So I'm pleased to be introducing our first, uh, I'll introduce the panelists first uh, in the interest of time. So Professor uh, Teresa Caldera uh, is a professor of city and regional planning at UC Berkeley. Uh, she, in 2012, she was named a Guggenheim Fellow and her major book uh, that won an award uh, from uh, American Ethnological Society in 2001 is entitled City of Laws, Crime, Segregation, and Citizenship in Sao Paulo. And that came out in 2000. Uh, my introduction is also very short. <laughs> Our second speaker is Colin uh, Milbert, Associate Prof Professor of English at UC Davis. And he's also the Gary Snyder Chair in Science and the Humanities and Ed currently also the director of the UC Davis Humanities Innovation Lab. And his major publication uh, is entitled Nano Vision, Engineering in the Future, which came out of Duke in 2008. Uh, assistant Professor Jeffrey Lee uh, is a professor, uh, professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley, and he's working on the book for which he got the fellowship entitled Consciousness and the Passage of Time. And uh, in the meantime, he has numerous forthcoming uh, publications uh, and others, uh, other articles that are already published, including uh, such articles as Materialism and the Epistemic Significance of Consciousness, Alien Subjectivity and the Importance of Consciousness, and Unity and Essence in Chalmers' Theory of Consciousness. Uh, last but not the least, Professor Imam Wan Wong is Assistant Professor of Film and Digital Media at UC Santa Cruz. I'm very happy to welcome her back because she was our Global Studies postdoctoral fellow here for one year or two years? One year. One year. <laughs> I thought I knew her then, but I, and so I thought I knew her for maybe two years, but, um, but it was good that uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see her back. And she's actually been spending a lot of time in LA this year, so that's also been great. And uh, her book just came out, congratulations, uh, it's entitled um, Remaking Chinese Cinema Through the Prism of Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Hollywood. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to start the conversations with um, Teresa. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to thank the Humanities Network and UCHRI for organizing this terrific meeting, meeting and especially for providing us with this fellowship. It's a precious time to have time to be out of our regular jobs doing research, and I really appreciate it. So, just for fun, as the title of the first chapter of Colleen's new book, Mondo Nano, Fun and Games in the World of Digital Matter. The reading of this fascinating book 
chapter I read was for me, as for many other people here, this today, um, a journey of estrangement. An anthropologist's training in scrutinizing urban practice, the material embodiment of inequalities in metropolitan spaces, and the rituals of democratic making and unmaking, to encounter the world of nanotechnology, games, nanocars, and buckyballs was literally entering into another world about which I know nothing. So the more I read, the more I asked myself, how do I comment on this? If at least the chapter assigned to me were the one on Nano City, maybe I would have more to say <laughs> since cities is my territory and the Nano City project was developed by my graduate students. But, what, but that was not it, so the whole chapter was beyond my comfort zone. I'd say, though, that I was encouraged by part of Colin's argument by the proposition that, quote, sometimes being silly is the only way to glean the dimensions of material and historical change that would otherwise remain unknowable and unspeakable, unquote. Silliness and playfulness as mode of vision, a mode embarked by the people involved in developing nanotechnology and by calling himself. Well, maybe it would be a bit available to me as well, we'll see. <laughs> but let me tell you a bit about Colin's work. The book he's completing aims to show how nanotechnology and its quest to control and manipulate the structure of matter have developed in relation to video games and computational technology. My contention, he states in the book description, is that the core research practice practice, experimental systems, and laboratory instruments of molecular sciences have evolved significantly in response to gaming as a cultural practice. The chapter one that I read, just for fun, grounds the argument for the book by tracing a history of playful images and ludic practice in nanotechnology. Fun, playfulness, and being silly are inherent to the practice of the molecular scientists who launched nanotechnology. Gaming and playing are part of the modus operandi of the molecular science. By analyzing the making of nanocars and nanosoccer, Colin shows how the molecular scientists and experiments involved in nanotechnology with an eye on the future of digital matter create nano toys and play with them as a mode of investigation slash fun. Quote, many of the scientific objects animated in nanotechnology laboratories, the forms that experiments take and the characteristics of technical knowledge are now fashioned through participatory play instead of the idealized distance of objectivity through the creative performance of gaming instead of the venerable stepwise protocols of the scientific method, unquote. As if such a thing, the scientific method exists, right? The play is the work, the game is the experiment, and the silly image is the technical feat. But this shift in scientific mode does not happen in the isolation of the laboratories alone. Molecular toys, Parodies and sport events played at the nano level indicate, quote, global transformation of play culture now afoot, the elevation of play from the domain of childhood to the domain of adult productivity, unquote. Imagining atom by atom assembly becomes easy as a child's play because, precisely because this vision is produced by our culture of child's play. It is a dream informed by the society of game. Society of the game. In this context, Colin argues, playing with nano toys is an index of increasingly widespread conditions of play labor or play work that shapes today's technoculture, a culture shaped by, quote, different ethos, hack, sheet, modify, and hatch, unquote. Colin builds the demonstrations of his thesis in this chapter mostly on the basis of the analysis of narratives of people involved in the operations of nanotechnology. As such, it is mostly an internal reading, what anthropologists would call the reproduction of the native's point of view, 
although one based only on native narratives, not on the researcher's own observation of their practice, as anthropologists would do, and not on following the researchers in the laboratory, as Bruno Latour would suggest we do. Calling traces the history of nanotechnology, some of its main experiments, and how it goes from a joke to a global enterprise, from total silliness to common sense, on the basis of the words of the protagonists of these stories. At several points, however, the account of their perspective is masterfully made strange by the use of brief ironic phrases that both conclude an argument and make us doubt it, laugh, or at least distance a little bit from them, from the arguments of the scientists. It is his entrance, call his entrance, into the scientist's game of playfulness. He states, quote, Mondo Nano, his book, aims to offer a humorous yet critical account of this molecular world of fun and games, unquote. In this sense, thus, not only the main information, but also the mode of vision are the native ones. He is playing their game, both accepting their description of what they do and adopt their mode of operation. He concludes this chapter I read with the phrase, why not just play along and laugh? I kept thinking, what are the potentialities and the limits of playing along as a mode of knowledge production and of critique? It is to, in, is to inhabit the worlds we study and adopt their own modes of operation sufficient as a way to know. Calling one uh, wants to offer us a humorous yet critical account. But, if I, but I feel compelled to ask the maybe totally old-fashioned question, how are we to conceive of critique? I'm not joking here. <laughs> maybe Many of us here are obviously investigating new formations. You are dealing with things in the making for which we may not yet have a perspective from which to engage with. We create our tools as we encounter them. We experiment. We collect the narrative of the prediction as we encounter. But in which ways can we be critical? As I have been working with the new practice, they are now transgressively transforming the public in cities such as Sao Paulo, I have asked myself the question many times. This practice includes several forms of, of appropriating the city and transforming its publics through street art and circulation, from graffiti to tagging, from skateboarding to parkour and several forms of moving around. They are forms of enjoyment of the city and described as such but also of transgressively transforming the modes operandi of the city. But to unfold their meaning, the meaning of this practice, and interrupt the interventions they make, and interpret the interventions they make in the city, can I just evaluate their claims in the same terms in which they have been proposed? I would say no. In my case, I have tried to find ways to create a perspective that both records the point of view of the urban performers just oppose it to other points of view also expressed in public space and evaluate in it in relation to the effects they produce both in the city and in the relationship with others they engage with. I refuse to become a native as much as I refuse to become silent. To engage directly and controversially with your, my subjects, I think, is to engage with them as co-citizens, as people with whom you can agree or disagree, debate, but also whose positions I can unsettle as much as they unsettle my own. This space of critique is thus constituted, I would suggest, from the juxtapositions, the dialogues and clashes between different positions, mine being one of them, and the analytical work of, of contextualization and historicization, but also of deconstruction. To talk about critique is usually something appreciated among the scholars like us. To be critical is something positive, but maybe we can spare some time scrutinizing its meaning and the ways in which it can work in our works. Thank you. Great, thank you. Colin's going to talk about Jeff's work in philosophy. Yeah, thank you, Teresa, and I really look forward to 
furthering the conversation about methodological issues, um, and particularly the question of fun, because I think part of what we're staging here in this particular roundtable is the pleasure we get in reading each other's work. And I have to say, as I'm transitioning into discussing Jeff's work, I had a really fantastic time reading his um, really wittily um, argued um, paper that he sent me. So Jeff's been working on philosophical aspects of temporal perception, how we relate to time, think time, how we apprehend the future, the present, and the past cognitively and emotionally. I had the pleasure to read a piece of his uh, project of his that's called In Defense of Lucretius. He starts off in this piece by looking backwards to Lucretius, and in particular, the argument that Lucretius famously made, famously made about our general sense of regret that we do not live longer than we do, our anticipations of being sorry that we will not exist beyond our own deaths to experience all the interesting things we might have had had we not died. <laughs> For Lucretius, this sensibility doesn't seem philosophically justifiable and that there would be equal reasons to regret, regret not having been born earlier, to experience all the interesting things that happened before we existed, and so forth. Lucretius's argument has been taken up and reassessed by any number of philosophers over the centuries, and Jeff examines the tradition of thought that, contra Lucretius, has argued that a human bias toward the future and a general desire to want more life still to come, rather than more life already behind us, is both advantageous and robustly rational. Jeff challenges this assessment, showing that there are various reasons why future bias does not appear to be robustly rational, and although he shows that it is certainly not irrational to be predisposed towards the future, he also shows that it is no more and no less irrational to be predisposed towards the past. But the significant twist of his extremely compelling argument eventually sidesteps the long-abiding concerns about rational consistency in our apperception of duration, and he instead takes a perspective relating to the care of the self, laying out the case for why would, why would we be better off if we were more temporally neutral, that is, no more bias toward the future than to the past or the present. For emotional, psychological, and social reasons, as well as philosophical ones, Jeff shows that temporal neutrality would be preferable to future bias. It's really a very nuanced argument, and I regret that I will not have time, as there really is never enough time, and this is always the problem, it seems, to rehearse all the brilliant maneuvers that he makes in this project, thinking to the question of why we look forward to regretting the fact that we will die too soon. <laughs> this initial pursuit of the question related to mortality, however, opens up onto a much vaster consideration of temporal being and temporal perception at large, constructions of time, and normative claims for how we ought to think the time available to us. There may be certain psychological or neurological features that make future bias difficult to readjust, but Jeff posits that, even so, it would be well worth our time to cultivate the epipomethian as well as the promethean potentialities of our attitudes to time. Jeff's paper provoked a number of new perspectives for me on my own work. My research focuses on various cultures of speculation, or perhaps cults of speculation, whether in science fiction or technological forecasting or futures markets, or the anticipatory modes of play promoted in video games. The people I study are extremely biased towards the future, so Jeff's analysis provided a number of insights into the logic of speculative anticipation, especially the role of regret, or anticipated regret, in shaping our relations to time. So it was along these lines that I did have a few questions, on the one hand relating to technological promises, and on the other hand relating to media, narratives, and fiction, <coughs> pleasures of fiction. So first off, I've been studying the cultural history of nanotechnology for about 15 years now, and many of the scientists and visionaries invested in this field share a commitment to the idea that it will eventually transform the world in innumerable ways. Jeff's paper made me recall how much the future, as a figure of nanotechnology discourse, is actually channeled through anxieties about mortality. Many nanotech enthusiasts hope that molecular science research will lead to radical life extension or even physical immortality. For example, Ray Kurzweil, who writes best-selling books about these issues, has one book called Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever. <laughs> and the point of this book is that the technological capacity to make us all immortal is coming. It is inevitable, but still a few decades away. 
So if we want to stay alive long enough to get to this future, we need to take good care of ourselves in order to survive until it happens. That's the nature of the argument. Okay, it's a perfect example of everything that Jeff's talking about. But I wondered, let's say Kurzweil and company are right, and nanotechnology does make immortality possible in the future. Given infinite lifespans, would the problem of future bias suddenly shift? insofar as it would conceivably make the more common regret to become not having been born earlier or not having enough past to look backwards to, since there now would be no question of having plenty of time to look forward to. <laughs> it's a particular speculative scenario, of course, but it raised the general question for me. How much does temporal bias and therefore the challenge of cultivating a temporal neutrality depend upon historical conditions? And that is also to say cultural specificity. In other words, and it's a question for Jeff, does history matter for a philosophical understanding of temporal bias? And then on the other topic of media and narrative, Jeff's analysis primarily concerns the human capacity to think the future or the past using cognitive resources, memories, and desires more or less internal to an individual, my memories, my lifetime, my future, and so forth. And I wonder to what extent does temporal perception and especially the affects pertaining to time change in relation to narratives or the mediations of other people's lives in the form of stories, for example, or in documentary materials from other time periods. Now, I study science fiction, which is ostensibly about futurity and getting people to think about the future, but it would seem that historical fictions or historical texts similarly get people to think about the past. And some of us can be very emotionally invested in thinking of the past um, in a way that Jeff thinks about an excited, anticipatory looking backward equivalent to a looking forward. Historians, I think, do this quite habitually, but we know of any number of historical fictions that will often motivate audiences to have deep emotional and, um, speculation or anticipation of what is going Going to happen even when they already know what is going to happen we can think about the sensations around the film titanic and so forth so jeff uh, now these kind of historical fictions don't presuppose our causal relationship to the past and jeff has an extensive discussion of how for some future bias seems to relate to an ability to affect events yet to come or at least to imagine doing so whereas events in the past cannot be changed and he actually considers whether these are legitimate perceptions but we could think about how historical research historical narrative or even personal recollections of the past often involve reinterpretation if not even outright revisionism new discoveries made about the past and so forth and then there's the obvious examples of alternative history fictions and various time travel scenario fantasies, which don't necessarily mark an actual ability to change the past, but certainly a cultural desire to do so. And then this made me think about quantum physics and various other aspects of um, basically the cutting edge of um, astrophysics and so forth positing the possibility of time travel in a scientific kind of sense, using tachyons to send messages to the past and therefore potentially changing it, or the twists of space-time called wormholes and whether we might be able to do something with these, or even what is actually now a field of scientific experimentation, the so-called quantum eraser experiments where measurements on whether a photon exhibits itself as a particle or a wave by virtue of the um, observational apparatus can be retroactively changed in terms of changing the, oper the observational apparatus, which then retroactively shows that the phenomenon itself had changed in the past, even though it had originally exhibited itself in another way, it seems. So spooky stuff. But it just made me wonder to what degree um, might a causal relationship to the past also change our um, sense of temporal um, commitment and devotion and so forth. Uh, Jeff's going to comment on Iman's project in film studies. Okay, is that, is that working? Yep. No. no. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, thanks, Colin, for those uh, really thoughtful comments. Um, yeah, and I also wanted just to start by uh, yeah, thanking the UC HRI for giving me the fellowship in the first place. So uh, that was a great privilege, and it's really nice to have the funding to spend a lot of time thinking about my research. That's been really nice. And it's also just great to be here today um, and being part of this panel talking to you guys right now. Um, okay, so I'm going to be um, addressing um, some uh, w work that I read by uh, Yiman Wang, um, uh, who is working in film studies, and she is currently working on a project about... Um, 
the Chinese American uh, actress Anna Mae Wong, um, uh, who um, was a film star through the the twenties through the fifties during the era of segregation. Um, uh, specifically, that's the era when the Chinese Exclusion Act was still in place and also a ban on interracial marriage between uh, whites and Chinese. Um, and um, the, the piece, that, uh, the sort of extract of the, the, the article that I read um, deals with the ways in which um, Mei Wong's on, on-screen persona both conformed to, um, but also in subtle ways subverted the Orientalist expectations of about race that the uh, the pr- primarily white audience uh, would have had at the time. Um, so to sort of uh, understand uh, uh, the points that Yiman wants to make, we need to just have a, a, a little bit of history of Anna Mae Wong herself. So she uh, started off life um, at, in as a as um, having fairly minor roles in silent movies, Um, but then um, carried on being an actress in America uh, during the early part of the the period when um, uh, talkies started. Um, And notably, um, she spoke with an American accent um, in those movies, um, even though she was generally presented with a sort of uh, exoticized orientalized um, uh, um, sort of visual presentation um, at the time that kind of confounded the critics they were they, they found it hard to know how to describe her she was often described as having um, you know a Chinese exterior but an American interior that kind of thing um, then she moved to Europe um, where she became a bigger star and part of, part of her success there turned on the fact that she um, uh, coach, was, was coached to be able to speak with an English accent and also be able to be able to speak French and German. Um, and the sort of narrative about her that, that was given at the time was that that gave her this kind of glamorous, cosmopolitan, transnational appeal. Um, and then, when she then in the sort of sort of third part of her career, when she moved back to the US, uh, that really sort of led to her becoming a serious star. Um, even though she never was a leading lady because she wasn't white. Um, okay, so that's just the, that's the background facts about um, anime one. So um, Yi Man is sort of concerned in this piece with uh, this persona that Mei Wong has on the screen, um, and specifically with this kind of uh, contrast between her sort of exotic, orientalized visual presentation and the fact that. Um, she was early on speaking with an American accent and then later with this sort of uh, cosmopolitan, sort of British um, inflected accent. Um, and so the question is, what reading should we give of sort of that kind of split presentation uh, that she had? And um, Yi Man sort of contrasts two approaches you might have. You might think of this presentation as being kind of like a hybrid presentation where she was trying to make herself more appealing by sort of fusing together this sort of uh, um, orientalist spectacle with uh, various features of an American person to sort of create this kind of more palatable hybrid. But but that's not Yiman's reading. Yiman says that it's important to sort of see this um, split between the visual and spoken presentation as contradictory and confounding. Um, those two things just can't be made to fit with each other, and that's sort of part of the uh, that's sort of part of the reason why she was an interesting figure. Um, so, um, and she goes further. She even says that um, we should we should see this sort of um, conflict or confound between these two elements of her presentation on the screen as challenging ordinary ideas about how cinema uh, sort of creates the illusion of events happening. So you might think, we've got this sort of visual image on the screen and the soundtrack. So in the case of a person on the screen, we're going to have uh, you know, the visual image of the person and then the voice being played out. And we sort of expect those things to blend together to sort of create an integral uh, sort of illusion of a, you know, a real person there. Um, 
But Yiman emphasizes how the fact that uh, Wong was speaking with an, either an English or an American accent was kind of uncanny to um, viewers at the time. Um, you know, sort of in the way in which um, it might seem uncanny if you were if you saw uh, like a female body on the. I have only one minute left. Okay, all right. All right. I'll, I'll try and speed up. Um, sort of in the way in which if you saw a female body on the screen with a male voice coming out, that might seem uncanny to you. Uh, and the idea is that um, uh, that in sort of creating that uncanny feeling, what Mei Wong was doing was trying to sort of play with. Uh, play with viewers' expectations and sort of create a sense that what they're seeing really is a kind of illusion um, rather than trying to make it make what's on the screen seem real and um, in that way challenge their sort of orient, or orientalist presuppositions about Chinese people um, suggesting that you know those might be an illusion um, okay so I'm almost out of time so I was going to make a bunch of points and questions so let me just stick, let me just go with one of them um, okay um, so, yeah, so, so Yi Man wants to emphasize um, the sort of illusory quality of uh, Wong's on screen persona. Um, and, you know, that idea made me think about this whole distinction between uh, um, an actress's on screen persona versus their off screen persona. Um, one way you might think of it is that there's this real, there's, there's the real anime Wong off screen, which is in, who is in some way concealed by her on screen persona. Um, but maybe that's not the right way of looking at it. Uh, and this sort of relates to more general questions about um, identity and personality, which are at least tangentially related to the stuff I'm interested in about the self and time. Um, so we tend to think of ourselves as having a kind of core self defined by certain values and dispositions. So we talk about acting authentically or being true to yourself. Um, but there's a pretty well-known debate in social psychology, which also has been of interest to philosophers interested in the self, about whether we really do have a core self in that sense. Maybe we just perform in different ways in different contexts, and there's not one way of being or performing that really sort of expresses our true self. Um, and if that's right, then it might be it might be that there isn't a sense. There's no sense in which the on-screen persona of a person like Anime Wong is less true to their real self than their off-screen persona. Uh, it might just be that those are just two different ways of sort of performing in the world that are uh, you know on uh, level footing. Um, and uh, yeah, and that relates to sort of. Uh, questions about how we think about our identity over time and what it actually is to continue existing. Um, so if you think of yourself as having this core self, this core personality, then you might think that something like being brainwashed uh, so that your personality completely changes, that would be pretty much as bad as death because that would destroy your core self. Um, but, if, but if our personality traits are more flexible and less well-defined, then... Um, one more sentence, then we ordinarily think then uh, that might be the wrong way of looking at ourselves. So um, anyway, so that was like my attempt to sort of try and bridge between uh, Yiman's discussion of Anime Wong and my own thoughts about um, ourselves persisting through time. So uh, my time's over. <laughs> Uh, during the discussion, you know, there will be sort of a okay. more of a mutual conversation later on. So, Iman's going to be commenting on Teresa's uh, project. All right. First of all, thank you, thank you, Jeff, for uh, commenting, passing my argument, and uh, you really look forward to. Oh, sorry. So, thank you, Jeff, for. Is it on? It takes a second. Oh. Okay. Oh, no? okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, thank you so much again <laughs> for passing up my analysis, and I really look forward to addressing the issue, which it sounds to be really intriguing, the issue of temporality and uh, identity. Um, so uh, I want to comment on um, uh, Teresa's paper, uh, essay, which is actually already published, entitled Imprinting and Moving Around, New Visibilities and Configurations of the Public Space in Sao Paulo, which was published in Public Culture 2012. So, um, so because the 
article was already published. I thought I won't go into too many details of the analysis itself, but rather I'll just read uh, the uh, beginning of the article, then I'll segue into my questions. So uh, this article is mainly concerned with um, gravity, tagging, and the radical movements around in the city, kind of transgressing the city space. So uh, Teresa argues that these are interventions, urban, urban interventions. And these interventions in public spaces are transforming and at the same time articulating anew the profound social inequalities that have always marked them, the urban space. Expressed as both artistic production and urban performance, they not only give the support new visibility in the city, but also expresses, express new forms of political agency. However, this is the intriguing part. These interventions are contradictory. They, afford, they affirm rights to the city while fracturing the public, expose discrimination, but refuse integration. They test the limits of democratization process by simultaneously expanding the openness of the democratic public space while challenging it with transgressive actions, ranging from morally illicit to the criminal. So, um, so reading this essay was an exhilarating experience, both physically and intellectually. And I constantly feel, like physically, I constantly feel the dialectical jolt between the bondage and anti-bondage, and between the horizontal permeation and vertical exaltation, because the, the essay is really completely saturated by sort of, uh, if I can visualize it in one image, that is the body hanging in suspense, kind of uh, doing the graffiti or zipping through the urban space on the motorcycles. So there is this kind of traumatic, uh, tremendous uh, dynamic, physical dynamic that I'm really engaged with. So um, in a way, this essay continues some of the issues studied in uh, Dick Haptich's book, two books. One is uh, uh, Dick Haptich's Subculture, The Meaning of Style, and the other book is uh, Michelle Sertel's The Practice of Everyday Life, especially walking in the city. So the essay continues some of the some of the issues raised in these books, but then also um, uh, but then also bring it uh, sort in a way up to date and bring it into a new uh, bring it with a new spa spatial temporal twist. In a way, sort of joined upon uh, yesterday's uh, uh, or, or what I learned from the panel. Uh, one notion that I want to return to is. Harry Kakia Bresson's idea of the decisive moment, which I think is uh, really cogent to uh, the study here. Um, Kakia Bresson defines the decisive moment as um, uh, it is a simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the significance of an event, as well as the precise organization of the forms which give that event its proper expression. So in other words, um, uh, the decisive moment seems to me to suggest that very pregnant moment where the event is taking place, but then the event is already not the raw footage, so to speak. It is an event that's already coached in this perfect form that's captured by the camera. So in a way, to sort of think, of, uh, think about that notion, the decisive moment, in relation to your work, what I'm wondering is, um, um, in the photo representation of the imprinting, uh, which includes graffiti and tagging, we see the products Basically, the photograph that you show in the essay uh, capture the product, which is already the graffiti, gra graffiti and tagging, but not the makers. We don't really see the makers who are actually in the action. And you very nicely call the actor, call the makers the urban actors and urban performers. And we, we did, these are really very suggestive terms. So, uh, nor do we see the mobile bodies. <laughs> Uh, that defy urban regulations and challenge physical principles such as gra gravity, right? So in a way, I wonder um, why the makers are rendered absent. The people who are creating the graffiti, doing the tagging, and people who are zipping through the uh, urban space, which are very much the focus in the essay itself, but in your photographic uh, uh, capitulation, recapitulation of their action, th these bodies are absent, right? Mm -hmm. So. 
Uh, so how would you theorize their cultural production and intervention differently if they are actually captured in the photograph? So in other words, if we actually do see the event happening in the perfect form, the bodies are there, like in the photo we saw yesterday, uh, the photo that inspired the idea of the decisive moment, that is the body, is, uh, the foot, the split second before the foot touches the water surface, right? Mm -hmm. So that is this kind of a pregnant, pre pregnant dynamic moment where you have the body, and then you have the event, and you have the form that captures that event, right? So if we put all of those dimensions together, then uh, then it sort of uh, uh, really offers a very precise, interesting moment for discussing the uh, for discussing the agency in politics. So the, another another um, uh, question that I had concerns audience. Um, so who consumes these works and how are they affected by the work they consume? Because uh, uh, some of the photos, um, I think a couple of them uh, presented in the essay, they include the passerbys, but then the passerbys are pretty much uh, uh, oblivious to the um, to the um, uh, to what is the background, the graffiti, and so on. So the idea of the audience. So uh, in the section with my work is the idea uh, is um, uh, the question of agency, and I really want to uh, bring this up before I bring this to a closure. Um, so. I very much appreciate your uh, argument of the paradoxical agency, but the way you formulate it, uh, formulate the paradoxical agency is that these urban actors expose discrimination but refuse assimilation. They expose social injustice but take it for granted, and they are incapable of envisioning it being different. So uh, what I'm puzzled over here is why is assimilation the best option uh, for a political action, and why is exposing and critiquing the inequality itself is not an attempt to envisioning things to, to envision things differently. So I want to bring sort of a heart back to Colin's idea on the play, the role of parody and play. Uh, that, how does that figure into this whole uh, intervention thing? Uh, all right, so I think I have a methodological question, but we can talk about it.